This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Focused cardiac ultrasonography is a point of care qualitative or semi-quantitative means of assessing the heart that is performed and interpreted by the clinician at the same time as the physical examination. Multiple studies in inpatient and outpatient settings have shown that focused cardiac ultrasonography is more reliable and accurate than physical examination for the diagnosis of left ventricular systolic dysfunction. This video presents a practical method for conducting visual assessment of the left ventricular systolic function with focused cardiac ultrasonography. Focused cardiac ultrasonography is indicated in outpatient and inpatient settings for screening and diagnostic purposes. Diagnostic indications include acute critical cardiopulmonary conditions such as dyspnea, chest pain, trauma, arterial hypotension, shock, respiratory failure, and cardiac arrest. Focused cardiac ultrasonography should not replace physical examination or more advanced comprehensive diagnostic measures such as formal echocardiography. The heart is a fibromuscular organ with an oblique orientation located in the middle mediastinum. The left ventricular cavity is enclosed by the endocardial border. On its long axis and on the apical four-chamber plane, it has a bullet-shaped structure with its long axis spanning from the apex to the base of the heart. On its short axis, it has a circular shape with an irregular inner surface. The endocardial and epicardial borders surround the left ventricular wall. Systolic function relies on shortening of the muscle fibers along the longitudinal and circumferential planes of the left ventricle. From the beginning to the end of systole, these changes are manifested by a displacement of the mitral annulus towards the apex, increased wall thickness, and decreased cavity size. Focused cardiac ultrasonography requires an ultrasound system with two-dimensional imaging, ultrasound transmission gel, a low-frequency phased array probe, and a pair of gloves. Before beginning the procedure, wash or sanitize your hands. Explain the procedure to the patient and mention that the procedure is not associated with risk or complications. Place the ultrasound machine at the head of the patient's bed on the patient's right side. Put on a pair of gloves and expose the patient's thorax. If possible, place the patient in the left lateral decubitus position. The most validated echocardiographic views for the visual assessment of the left ventricular systolic function are the apical four-chamber view, the parasternal long axis view, and the parasternal short axis view. To obtain an image in the apical four-chamber view, set the field depth between 15 and 20 centimeters and place the probe at the point of maximal impulse. Alternatively, you can start scanning at the anterior axillary line and move toward the nipple using a zigzag movement. Hold the probe at an angle of 60 degrees relative to the chest wall facing the sternal notch with the orientation marker pointing toward the 3 o'clock position. Since the orientation marker on the probe indicates the right side of the screen, the left ventricle and atrium will be seen on the right side of the screen. To obtain an image in a parasternal view, set the field depth between 12 and 20 centimeters and place the probe over the left third or fourth intercostal space adjacent to the sternum. To obtain an image in the parasternal long axis view, point the orientation marker toward the 10 o'clock position or the patient's right shoulder and hold the probe perpendicular to the chest wall. The heart should be visualized in a horizontal orientation, showing the aortic and mitral valves, but not the left ventricular apex. To obtain an image in the parasternal short axis view, first find the parasternal long axis view, then rotate the probe clockwise until the orientation marker points toward the 2 o'clock position or the patient's left shoulder and decrease the field of depth to 10 to 14 centimeters. The left ventricle should be seen at the center of the screen as a circular structure in which the endocardial and epicardial borders can be consistently visualized. 
to evaluate the left ventricular systolic function by means of focused cardiac ultrasonography, use the following four echocardiographic measures, longitudinal shortening, anterior mitral leaflet motion, thickening of wall segments, and change in the area of the cavity. Longitudinal shortening is best evaluated in the apical four-chamber view. Identify the segment between the base and the apex of the heart, which corresponds to the left ventricular longitudinal plane. The lateral and septal mitral annuli can be used as anatomical reference points. The segment reaches its maximum length at end diastole. During systole, the base moves toward the apex, causing the segment to shorten until it reaches its minimum length at end systole. The difference between the maximum length and the minimum length during the same cardiac cycle yields the estimated longitudinal shortening. A difference of at least one centimeter indicates normal left ventricular systolic function, whereas a difference of less than one centimeter suggests severely reduced left ventricular systolic function. Longitudinal shortening should also be evaluated in the parasternal long axis view. Anterior mitral leaflet motion can be evaluated only in the parasternal long axis view. Imagine drawing a line from the base to the apex of the heart along the midline of the left ventricular cavity. In early diastole, the mitral valve leaflets separate widely, with the anterior mitral leaflet moving toward the ventricular septum. When the movement or the motion of the anterior mitral leaflet extends beyond the midline, it indicates normal left ventricular systolic function. But when the motion does not extend beyond the midline, it suggests severely reduced function. Thickening of wall segments is best evaluated in the parasternal short axis view. Wall thickness is minimal at end diastole. During systole, the myocardium contracts, causing the wall to increase in thickness until it reaches its maximum thickness at end systole. The fractional increase in wall thickness from end diastole to end systole during the same cardiac cycle yields the estimated thickening of wall segments. Uniform thickening throughout most of the wall segments with an increase in thickness by at least one-third indicates normal left ventricular systolic function whereas an increase in thickness by less than one-third suggests severely reduced function. Thickening of wall segments should also be evaluated in the apical four-chamber and parasternal long-axis views. Change in the area of the cavity is best evaluated in the parasternal short-axis view. The space enclosed by the endocardial border represents the area of the left ventricular cavity. The cavity reaches its maximum area at end diastole. During systole, the endocardial walls move closer to one another, thereby reducing the area of the cavity until the cavity reaches its minimum area at end systole. The fractional decrease in the area from end diastole to end systole during the same cardiac cycle yields the estimated change in the area of the cavity. A decrease by at least one-third indicates normal left ventricular systolic function whereas a decrease by less than one-third suggests severely reduced function. The change in the area of the cavity should also be evaluated in the apical four-chamber and parasternal long-axis views. To begin your evaluation of left ventricular systolic function, obtain images first in the apical four-chamber view, then in the parasternal long-axis view, and finally in the parasternal short-axis view. We will show images from two patients. Patient 1 has normal left ventricular systolic function, and patient 2 has severely reduced left ventricular systolic function. In the apical four-chamber view, identify the structures of interest, including the lateral and septal mitral annuli, the apex, and the endocardial and epicardial borders. Using the ruler or M-mode vector line on the screen, evaluate longitudinal shortening. In patient 1, the difference between the maximum length and the minimum length is at least 1 cm, whereas in patient 2, the difference is less than 1 cm. Then evaluate thickening of wall segments. In patient 1, the thickness is markedly increased by at least one third, whereas in patient 2, the thickness is clearly increased by less than one third. Finally, evaluate the change in the area of the cavity. In patient 1, the area is unmistakably decreased by at least one-third, whereas in patient 2, the area is decreased by less than one-third.
In the parasternal long axis view, identify the structures of interest, including the anterior mitral valve leaflet, the endocardial and epicardial borders, and the midline of the left ventricular cavity. Evaluate the anterior mitral leaflet motion. In patient 1, the leaflet clearly extends beyond the midline of the left ventricular cavity during early diastole. But in patient 2, the leaflet does not extend beyond the midline. The results for thickening of wall segments in this view are similar to the results in the apical four-chamber view. As are the results for the change in the area of the cavity. and for the longitudinal shortening. Obtain images in the parasternal short axis view. Identify the structures of interest including the endocardial and epicardial borders. Again, the results for the thickening of the wall segments in this view are similar to the results of the apical four-chamber and parasternal long axis views. as are the results for the change in the area of the cavity. As you perform the procedure, it is imperative to correlate and integrate the information collected in each view to complete the assessment of each echocardiographic measure. Consistency among all four measures and views is essential for an accurate visual assessment of the left ventricular systolic function. If all four measures are rated as normal, as in patient 1, it is reasonable to grade the left ventricular systolic function as normal, which would correspond to an estimated ejection fraction of more than 55%. When all four measures are rated as abnormal, as in patient 2, it is reasonable to grade the left ventricular systolic function as severely reduced, which would correspond to an estimated ejection fraction of less than 30%. When some measures are rated as normal, but others are rated as abnormal, or when some measures cannot be properly evaluated, it may not be possible to grade the left ventricular systolic function definitively. Proper use of focused cardiac ultrasonography may be limited by patient-related factors such as obesity, obstructive pulmonary diseases, and mechanical ventilation. By measure-related factors such as intrinsic mitral or aortic valve diseases, regional wall motion abnormalities, and conditions that distort left ventricular anatomy, and more importantly, by operator competence. Left ventricular systolic function is a cornerstone of management in the vast majority of cardiac diseases, and it can be better characterized with appropriate use of focused cardiac ultrasonography. Four echocardiographic measures in the left ventricle, longitudinal shortening, anterior mitral leaflet motion, thickening of wall segments, and change in the area of the cavity can facilitate a qualitative or semi-quantitative assessment of the left ventricular systolic function.